Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, I am Professor Uzi Ravi, Director of the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern African Studies. I am very pleased to be here with you today. I welcome you all for the uh, annual John Gendel Symposium on the Middle East. And uh, before we start, actually, uh, let me just uh, say some words about uh, this whole venture and uh, the man himself, John Gendel a true supporter, a stalwart supporter of Israel, uh, a true friend of Tel Aviv University, who has um, supported many, many uh, ventures of Jewish education, Yad Vashem, etc. And uh, we thank him for his uh, um, continuous support of us, Israel, Tel Aviv University. And without further ado, I would like actually to uh, let uh, Mr. John Gannel come up with his own message, please. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and many friends and colleagues in Israel and around the world. Greetings from Melbourne, Australia. As you heard already, my name is John Gandel, and I am one of the governors of Tel Aviv University. My wife and I and our extended family have been supporters of the TAU for many years, and we are very proud to be associated with the university and lend our name to this prestigious symposium. But more on that a little later. Let me first address the current global COVID-19 crisis. One year ago in September, I welcomed the 2020 Gandal Symposium audience in a Zoom session. In the midst of the COVID crisis, and I have to say back then, I wished for better days ahead. Yet, not much seems to have changed. In Melbourne, we are still currently in lockdown number six with severe restrictions such as nightly curfews, limited movements and stay-at-home orders, and unfortunately also rising COVID numbers. In fact, it is said that Melbourne has just achieved an unenviable feat. We have spent more days in lockdown than any other city in the world. Unfortunately, as I understand, you've had your challenges too, despite your early vaccination success when you led the world with your speedy approach. There are other concerns too that we grapple with, such as what sort of world will we live in post pandemic? Are we going to have annual vaccinations to curb this virus? Will we have to live with masks for years to come? And what sort of surveillance will we have to put up with? Indeed, there will be other challenges, such as various privacy concerns and personal data collections we might have to endure by our respective governments. Nevertheless, there is some good news with a large proportion of both our populations already being vaccinated or getting ready to be, so we just have to hope for better days ahead. So now, let me turn to why we are here today. I welcome you all to the 2021 Gandal Symposium titled Destination Israel 2021. Where are we heading? from regional cyber warfare to fruitful peace agreements. I have been given the honor and the privilege of greeting you all with some introductory remarks and opening the symposium, as well as introducing Professor Uzi Rabi, who is both our moderator and one of our speakers today. Let me just start by saying that I believe that human beings are never too old to learn, to understand, to seek knowledge, and to expand our horizons. And 
If history is anything to go by, then I know that the Gandalf Symposium held in Israel is an ideal place to achieve this. After today, I am positive that you will all have a better understanding of some of the key topics covered, but also an appreciation for the importance of having these types of fora and gatherings. These are indeed unique opportunities where leading minds of Israel share their knowledge, expertise and insight on the pressing issues that the world faces today. My wife and I are committed to supporting TAU to be the best at what it does, to be the educational and academic beacon, a center of excellence in numerous disciplines, from computer sciences and engineering to bioinformatics and cybersecurity. With some 130 research institutes, 400 labs, and over three and a half thousand projects annually, TAU is perfectly suited to encourage critical thought, exploration, and innovation. Indeed, universities are often hotbeds of ideas, technology, and innovation, and breeding grounds for future industry and policy leaders of the world. And TAU is truly a trailblazer in that sense. We also hope that the Gandalf Symposium can continue being part of that noble mission, contributing to the excellence of learning, knowledge sharing, research, and academic achievement at home in Israel and globally as well. I wish to thank and congratulate Tel Aviv University for organizing the 2021 Gandalf Symposium and bringing us all together. Please know this, Tel Aviv University has a great friend, not only in the Gandalf family, but amongst all Australians. The Australian Jewish community is arguably one of the most vibrant, cohesive and successful diaspora communities in the world. And it is also arguably most Zionist of all and the strongest supporter and advocate for the state of Israel and its people. And now, before I hand over to him to continue with the 2021 Gandalf Symposium, I'm pleased to say a few words about Professor Uzi Rabi. Professor Rabi is currently the director of the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies. And he's also a senior researcher at the Center for Iranian Studies, both at the Tel Aviv University. He delivers presentations in both academic and non-academic fora, and during Operation Protective Edge, Professor Rabi was a regular and familiar face in both Israeli and international media. Ladies and gentlemen, I now hand over to Professor Rabi, and I wish you all an interesting and insightful day of learning. With sincere regards from Melbourne, Australia, shalom to all. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Gandel. And uh, it is, as I said before, um, a real pleasure actually to re-moderate the uh, Gandel Symposium on uh, Middle Eastern Affairs. And I think that 2021, and this is how we try to title it this uh, time, Israel in the Middle East 2021, where are we heading to? Uh, it is of no doubt that the Middle East is experiencing a tumultuous change. And uh, we should actually pick up some highlights and try to make sure to come up with a balanced assessment as to where the region is heading to and what does that all mean when it comes to Israel. Of course, one can uh, 
choose or pick up uh, many, many issues that uh, are here in front of us on the table of the Middle Eastern agenda. But it goes without saying that the Islamic Republic of Iran is getting closer to fulfilling its bid for hegemony in the Middle East. It has been uh, 42 years since the uh, eruption of the Islamic Revolution in Tehran, and definitely Iran has become a dominant power in the Middle East. Of course, there are many problems in Iran proper, but basically when we are trying to measure the geopolitical uh, landscape, I think that Iran is uh, definitely kind of an item to be reckoned with. And of course, when it comes to Israel in the Middle East, many questions uh, are, uh, should, should be asked, and uh, this is exactly what we are going to do. Second, we are, and this is my opinion, of course, in the midst of what I would say geopolitical revolution. The one who teaches the history, modern history of the Middle East in the 19th century, 20th century, what goes without saying is the instrumentality of Western powers. This has been a pillar, for better or for worse, in the history of the region. Well, at least when it comes to the back of the mind of many players in the Middle East, we are in the midst of something that could be titled or depicted as a gradual evacuation of American forces from the Middle East and American influence in the region. To what extent this is the assessment? What does this, what does this actually mean when it comes to Israel and the Middle East? There are newcomers, Russia, China. It seems that we are in front of a new formula when it comes to the game or the play of superpowers in the Middle East. Of course, all these are to be reckoned with on top of the coronavirus. We are in uh, a midst of a real change in Israel. And uh, I think that we are having or going to have a lively discussion as to what, where, and how Israel should uh, face uh, problems, challenges, and at the same time, opportunities that can be found in the broader scene of the Middle East. I'm happy to say that uh, we are very privileged today to have with us uh, Mr. Alon Ben David, a friend of Tel Aviv University and a true friend of mine, and uh, I have to say that uh, if to name someone as the most conspicuous military analyst or military and defense affairs and analyst uh, that is coming up with the kind of a very, very firm saying as to what's going on in the neighborhood, so to speak, I think alone is uh, the best choice. And uh, uh, thank you alone for uh, uh, actually accepting our invitation. Alon has been there for almost, maybe maybe more than three decades, everywhere. I think uh, first Intifada, second Intifada, Lebanon, what have you. And he is, uh, 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 of course, uh, uh, would be kind of a, a suitable partner to have kind of a dialogue of uh, what we gonna have in the Middle East, what we already have in the Middle East, where Israel should uh, actually be found when it comes to the kaleidoscope of the region. So without further ado, alone, please come up with some of your sayings and understandings of what, where, we, where we are. Thank you very much, Professor Rabi. Delighted to be here, my alma mater here. I studied my uh, BA in Tel Aviv University. And I would like to offer my perspective on the Middle East. And when I look at the Middle East, Let's have a close look at the last 24 hours, because I believe that they encapsulate a lot of the things that are going on around us. Last night, 10 o'clock, Israeli aircraft are attacking targets inside Syria, T4 Air Force Base, 
According to the Syrian reports, those fighter aircrafts are flying above Jordanian airspace, penetrating Syria from the south, attacking those targets, and going back to Israel. More or less at the same time, Israeli soldiers are sent to evacuate an illegal tent established in the West Bank, being attacked by Israeli settlers. Two hours later, other Israeli soldiers are being sent to evacuate a Palestinian building and are being attacked by a Palestinian who runs down one of them with a car and injures, injures him uh, seriously. This morning, Palestinians in Gaza beginning to receive the second amount of Qatari money. And in the hours later, we are still following closely what's taking place inside Beirut, the Lebanese capital, where uh, I think unprecedented clashes um, are recorded there between Hezbollah supporters and Christian forces, so far six dead. We do not know how this is going to unfold from now on, but here you have in 24 hours many of the changes that we have seen in the Middle East in the last decade, and you know better than I do. Where was the Middle East 10 years ago? Maybe many of us forgot, but if you go back, rewind in your mind, where was this region 10 years ago? We, are, we marked this year uh, the 10th anniversary to what is known as the Arab Spring. And you know, I, I remember there was a picture taken maybe late 2010 or early 2011 of the Arab League Convention. And you look at the faces there, people that we consider to be immortal, eternal, Husni Mubarak, Muammar Gaddafi, Zaid Ben Ali, where are they? Everything changed. Now, I know that for many Israelis, this sense of change is threatening. They find it threatening on them. But I believe that what we are witnessing in the Middle East and the changes are not done yet. Yes, we will talk about Iran as one of the shaping forces. You've mentioned the US and its uh, diminishing presence in the region as another. I would add a third uh, power that shapes the region, and that's technology and the social network because that affects hundreds of millions in this region and drives social um, uh, changes in a pace that we've never seen before. But if you look at those changes, what you can see is that lots of the ideology that dominated this region for many years, as if Israel and the Israeli-Palestinian or the Israeli-Arab conflict are the, are the source of all problems in the region, most of the region don't buy that anymore. Most of the people in the Middle East understand that there are greater problems here. And what we've seen in the last year with the Abraham Accords that we've just uh, marked one year anniversary for them, I know that we're all cynical and we think, okay, so the Emiratis, they wanted new aircraft and the Moroccans, they wanted recognition for the Western Sahara. At the end of the day, it's a dramatic change. It's a dramatic change for the first time Israel is really beginning to appear as a legitimate partner in the region, which is trying to align itself vis-a-vis -vis the most uh, prominent threat, which is Iran. Yes, and Iran will be on our plate for the coming years. And we are all seeing the efforts of Israel to convince the Americans that they must take a stronger stand against the Iranians. Now, we weren't able to convince the Biden administration um, to abandon the old and bad deal in the eyes of most Israelis that uh, Obama signed with Iran in 2015. But we are at least now trying to persuade them that they no, don't need to give up everything and they, they have no need to rush to negotiations because the Iranians are under pressure. Now, having said that the Iranian deal appeared problematic for most Israelis, and I believe that I represent many of them in this perspective, at the end of the day, we have to be honest about one, one thing. We are going to talk a lot in the coming year about Israel's military option, and the IDF is preparing a military option, and I don't know if you heard yesterday, the Air Force requested the Americans to send us refueling aircraft earlier than scheduled so we can prepare ourselves for a military option. We have to be honest. The deal that was signed with Iran, with many, many flaws, and if I have to sum up the flaws in this deal, this is what we call the sunset clause, uh, the clause that dictates the expiration time of the deal and basically allows Iran or lifts most of the limitations on Iranian nuclear program in 2031, uh, 10 years from now, there was a problematic deal. But the deal gave us, Israel, something that we cannot achieve ourselves. We do not know 
how to uh, keep Iran away from nuclear capabilities for a decade. We don't know how to do that. I mean, we can launch the Air Force tonight to strike Iranian mil uh, nuclear facilities. And even though they haven't trained on that for many years, I guarantee you they will hit and destroy most of them. How long would it take the Iranians to rebuild those facilities? I'd say two years. And they will build them more uh, uh, dispersed and will build them uh, more underground. At the end of the day, 10 years is something that we cannot achieve. So or even those who were major opponents of the Iranian nuclear deal in Israel today agree that in the current situation, at least going back to 2015 will give us some time to think on our next move vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians. Sure, and uh, I, I uh, think that uh, what we could hear now is that, uh, well, Iran is a big story, and there are many, many questions to be asked as to whether Israel could and do, what, what is the scope of volume of any attack or whatever Israel can come up with. This is a debatable uh, issue, of course. Iran is buying time. They know how to do that. Uh, they have managed, in my opinion, to uh, persuade at least some portion of European states and maybe the new administration in the states that they mean business, but I don't see actually a kind of a thing with which to deal with. And here is again actually when we are talking about Iran, what we have to take into account is that in their bank of mind, there is a picture by which to become hegemon in the Middle East acquire nuclear ability, and again, using all the tactics that we have seen with the new foreign minister, Abdel Luhayan, while being asked actually, what do the Americans mean when they say that shortly negotiations are going to be renewed? He said shortly means that the Americans actually are going to follow closely our demands as to how to renew negotiations and etc. This is something that could tell us a lot about the Iranians. Of course, there are many problems in Iran. And we know, actually, that we are dealing with a cynical and very, very cruel leadership. But when it comes to their bid for hegemony, when it comes to their full control in Iran, look at what Alon actually just mentioned. Lebanon, Syria, one would say Iraq, or Yemen, all these are being termed in scholarly literature as failed states where Iran actually took advantage of but if you look by be using their weakness. Behind the regional expansion of Iran into the Iranian society and behind the facade and the tough facade that the Iranian leaders are trying to present to the world, at the end of the day, Iranian society is paying a very dear price for the sanctions. And that is exactly what our foreign minister is trying to explain in Washington today. That there is no need to rush into negotiations because who is under pressure? It's the Iranians and not the Americans. They have no need to rush to negotiate with them. Iranian society, large parts of it have deteriorated into humiliating poverty. We see favelas established outside the cities of Iran where children are growing barefoot in, in, exactly. in the sewer, exactly. and then there's prostitution and drug addiction. And I, I've seen a, a Facebook group in Iran a few months ago of Iranians wanting to sell organs just to get the cash to make a living. So Iranian society is in dire situation. And I believe that, I, I hope you'd agree, that the Iranian leadership understands that. Now bear in mind, the Iranian leader, Ali Khamenei, a man of 82, prostate cancer, probably that spread into other organs. He's not going to be there forever. Ali Khamenei, one of the, Khamenei, one of the two uh, people who established the Islamic Republic. I don't think that Ali Khamenei would like to see his life uh, enterprise, the Islamic Republic, being uh, transitioned to his successor when it's shakable, when it's not stable, when the economy is deteriorating. So I believe that the Americans have many cards to play and we are trying to persuade them and, that they don't need to give them up. And what we uh, have, I mean, what we hope is that, what we do hope is that the Americans will know how to play the cards. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I fully agree with you. I think that Iran, in the end of the day, would like actually sanctions to be lifted. They would like to have a, a better economic situation, but this has to do 
with what I said before, Iran is in full control. And don't forget, we have just witnessed an American sad saga in Afghanistan for Iran to see the Americans after 20 years in Afghanistan being evacuated in that form means that culturally or psychologically speaking, this is a victory. And this is a victory maybe for other Islamists, etc. But I agree with Alon, Iran would like actually to create kind of a balanced move in order to have a better shape when it comes to its economy. But the rule or the basic rule is politics of survival for these ayatollahs, revolutionary guards, and the new president, which is a new guy in town, Ibrahim Raisi, but he is mentioned as the not less than the successor of Ali Khamenei, which means it is very important for them to create something which has to do with kind of a harmony between all arms of control and rule in Iran. But let's take it to, we mentioned Afghanistan. Maybe just one word about Afghanistan. What is your take about that? Because, you know, Afghanistan is a state of agony, uh, suffered a lot. I mean, history could tell us that time and again. But if we are trying actually to measure or to say something about the impact of the Afghani saga on the Middle East and maybe on Iran, etc., would it be something that has to do with the American dwindling power in the Middle East? And where should we take this from that point? Absolutely. And you know, uh, it happened to be that I was in New York on 9-11, 9-11 uh, yep. 2001. And to see that full circle that the Americans have completed from going into Afghanistan with the ambition to change a society, to establish a new rule, to change the face of this country, and after 20 years, went back, you know, with their tail between their legs, is a very bad message for the, for the region. Now, for us, my outtakes from the Afghanistan situation is, A, for, for the first time since 2001, once again, we have a connection between a terror group and a territory. We basically have a state that could be the basis to, to become a terror state. And that's something that needs to concern us because those terrorist movements have been on the decline in the last few years, Daesh, Al-Qaeda, in the Sinai, in Iraq, in Syria. Now they are gaining territory, they are gaining an economic support from the opium uh, uh, fields of uh, uh, Afghanistan, and that could affect us. The second lesson is that in the new world, you cannot take a territory and impose the regime that you wish to have on that territory. And, and for us Israelis, all of those who are looking at uh, Gaza, for example, and imagine that one day, yes, we will go into Gaza, we'll overthrow Hamas regime, and we will uh, place a different regime on Gaza, one to our likes. Take a look at Afghanistan. You control the land, you can control the land, you cannot control the people and their minds. And at the end of the day, the Americans didn't succeed, despite the vast amounts of money that they've spent in Afghanistan, to really change the nature of that country. And at the end of the day, Af Afghanistan is back to where it started 20 years ago. Yeah, I fully agree. And uh, of course, this is something that we should just uh, bear in mind. You know, it is not that easy to get into that kind of a state or any other spot in the Middle East. As we say, the cliche goes like that. You know how you're going to go inside. Who knows, actually, in what shape you are going, if at all, be when you are uh, out of it. Um, but the flip side is here. And I have to say that because, you know, what we have seen in this decade, the post-Arab Spring decade, uh, we have seen horrors like ISIS. We have seen uh, uh, this Iranian moves here and there and some Arab states that seem to go to oblivion. But at the same time, there are some Arab states, and I uh, just uh, kind of a follow-up of one of your previous remarks, who jumped to the conclusion, or realized fully, fully realized, that much of the notions, they were feeding their own population in 20th century are null and void. And this has to do with Israel. The good thing 
a glimpse of hope is that there are Arab states that at a certain stage in the midst of this decade that we have gone through after the Arab Spring came to realize two things. First of all, Israel is not the enemy. Definitely not an existential enemy. But here comes the follow-up question. If Israel is not the enemy and we can be benefited from uh, an interaction with Israel, why shouldn't we do that? And I have to tell you, after having Hakafot or Simchat Hakafot Torah, or Hakafot Simchat Torah, sorry, in Manama in Bahrain, just two weeks ago, I'm not saying, and I don't want to exaggerate here, but I have to tell you, and I don't know if this is what you feel while dealing with the Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates and even Morocco uh, uh, to some extent, there is a kind of a feeling that these states, I, I, I hesitate while saying that, but seem to have crossed the Rubicon Absolutely. when it comes to Israel. And looking at the volume of trade which is being developed with the UAE, which is something unbelievable, you come to realize that the more you invest, the more you are uh, forging a kind of uh, economic interaction, cultural interaction, academic interaction, this is kind of a way where the price would be, or getting back to the status quo ante, would be very pricey for these states. I'll tell you what, even more about the uh, things that we are investing with, with our new uh, partners, uh, the UAE and uh, Bahrain. You know, for many years, traditionally, the military used to say that we, Israel, we don't have a border with Iran, but Iran has borders with us in Lebanon, in Syria, in Gaza. Now, the Iranians are sensing that they, the Iranians, they have a border with Israel because they look, and it's not beyond imaginable, at the UAE, and I can tell you that we can see in the foreseeable future Israeli fighters training there on UAE soil, flying above the Persian Gulf. Imagine what that would do to the Iranians. I can envision when we are talking with our known partners and our unknown partners about establishing a regional protection alignment against missile and uh, UAVs that will be able to detect those uh, UAVs when they're coming to strike, whether in Saudi Arabia, in Iraq, in Syria, or in Israel. There's a lot that we can do. And look at even at our clash, the clashes that we have with the Iranians in Syria. I don't think how many of you can appreciate the amount of activities that Israel is launching into Syria against the Iranians. I'll give you some numbers. We, we just calculated that with the chief of staff a few weeks ago. Israel, in the last three years, uh, according to foreign publications, because we are on the air, <laughs> has struck Syria about 300 times. 300 times in three years? Can you imagine what that says? It means a strike every three days. How does it work? How does it work when that we are launching strikes into Syria, despite the fact that, that the Russians are there with their protection systems, with their radars and their missiles? It works. Because the key word in the new Middle East that we have here now is frenemy. Everybody is a frenemy. What is a frenemy? A frenemy is someone that detects that me and him, we share the same interests. We are willing to cooperate based on that interest. I know, and he knows, that we're going to fight in three years' time. And that's OK. That works. Look at the Middle East, the new Middle East. Everybody is working with everybody, and everybody is screwing with everybody, and everything works. Now, the Russians in, in, in Syria are not friends of ours, if anyone is mistaken to think like that. They are frenemies. But the Russians are a frenemy that respects us. Why do they respect us? Because they look at us and they see a state that is willing to exercise its power, and they respect that. I know that the Russian Putin is, is perceived as a very unsentimental guy. He has a sentiment to Israel. He expressed it even in, in some of his statements. He calls Israel a Russian-speaking nation. He looks at us, he sees a nation with 1.5 million Russian speakers, 
And that does something to him. You know, people are looking at the, the pensions that uh, Putin is giving the veterans, the Russian veterans in Israel. It's small numbers, $50. It's not small that Russia is paying pensions for the citizens of other countries. And you know, Putin is about to start uh, paying taxes in Tel Aviv. You remember the apartment of his uh, elementary school teacher? He found out a few years ago that his very much beloved elementary school teacher is living in Tel Aviv in poverty. He came here, he bought her an apartment. She died. The hus her husband is still living there, but the apartment is under his name. I know Tel Aviv municipality is gonna get the bill. So Putin, he doesn't like the fact that we are striking in Syria, but he respects it. So he created what we called a deconfliction mechanism with us. What is a deconfliction mechanism? We have a hotline between our Israeli Air Force headquarters in Tel Aviv and Russian Air Force headquarters in Syria, Hamimim Air Force Base. And we, when we strike in Syria, about 15 minutes before we uh, launch the munitions, our Sergei in Tel Aviv picks up the phone, tells Yevgeny in Syria, Yevgeny Tavarish, we are about to strike in Misyaf. Yevgeny on the other side says, Davai, close the phone, and that's it. And I the, think Assad is firing everything he has, you know, SA-17, SA-22, SA-5. Russians, S-300, S-400 are not in the game. And that tells you something about an ideology-free Middle East. I, I, uh, you just got, uh, I mean, you just uh, brought kind of a ample example of how, uh, I mean, how many complexities we do have here when it comes to Syria. On the one hand, we have to just prevent Iran from having a foothold in Golan Heights, from delivering all that stuff to Hezbollah, etc. And at the same time, when you are doing that, you have to be fully accommodated with Russia in order not to get into sort of an imbroglio as happened to Erdogan with uh, Russia, etc. This is exactly what we do mean while saying that this is a, a sort of a shifting sense of Middle Eastern geopolitics. It is not that we have a winning formula on how to go on, but what we can definitely say at this stage is that the more you know, develop your knowledge, uh, be familiar and aware of Middle Eastern complexities, languages, history, the back, of, the back of the mind of him or the other. This is exactly kind of a highly demanded merchandise by which to have a full assessment of the Middle East at certain time, in time, and to come up with something that would be definitely uh, uh, very, very, uh, uh, very, very uh, efficient while coping with these uh, threats. Um, I would like also to uh, uh, just, just uh, uh, can you say some words about this Gaza thing? Because uh, I know that this is something that uh, has become uh, a real bothering thing because now we know and we have to admit a lot. The new government and the previous government, it seems that both of them have the same tricks about Gaza, which means almost nothing. And I, I would like to ask you, where do we stand here? Because it looks like a stalemate, and I'm not sure the Times is in favor of Israel when it comes to that. What is your take? Well, you know, when we ended the recent operation, uh, Guardian of the Walls, it's translated into English. Um, the IDF issued lots of memos about the great victory that we have achieved. The problem is that Hamas didn't read the memos. And they didn't act like they were defeated. And in the eyes of Hamas leadership, they yes, they have suffered the casualties and they have suffered the loss of physical assets, but at the end of the day, Yechia Sinwar, the guy who was uh, released from Israeli prison exactly 10 years ago in the Shalit deal, established himself as protector of Jerusalem by launching this salvo of rockets on Jerusalem at the first day, surprising us with this salvo, he was talking to Islamic history. You know, we look at Sinwar many times and, you know, he speaks good Hebrew, he reads his Israeli press, he, he, he listens to my reports on TV. People tend to forget that Sinwar is a very religious person. Religion is a key element of his identity. And when he fires 
missiles on Jerusalem, he speaks to Muhammad, he speaks to Salah Adin, he speaks to the Islamic history. So Sinwar came out of that conflict with a new sense of strength because for the first time, Gaza, the one territory that no one cares about, managed to connect all the arenas that Israel is dealing with. Because for the first time, he, create, he, he created movement of people inside Israel, within the Israeli Arabs, inside the West Bank. Rockets were launched from Lebanon. Rockets were launched from Syria on Israel in the time of a uh, guardian of the walls. And for him, it's a great victory. Now the question is, what are we doing with Gaza? And I believe that this government is asking itself th that question more seriously than previous governments, because at the end of the day, I can fight Gaza every year. I'm telling you that Hamas forces are no match to IDF forces, yeah. and there's no single Hamas brigade who could stop an IDF brigade when it starts to move. But we did it in 2009, again in 2012, again in 2014, again in 2021. How many times are we going to repeat the same action and hope for a new outcome? I think it's about time that we're going to ask ourselves, what are we doing with this territory, which is not going to like us? And the people in Gaza, they won't, they won't like us. But we need to ask us, ourselves, what are we doing and what kind of relationship are we going to have with this hostile territory? And I believe that if, if there's, uh, there'll be bold leadership on the Israeli side, there's a lot that we can do with Gaza that we haven't tried before. Well, uh, we have uh, some questions from the audience. And, um, uh, let's just uh, please, uh, somebody's waving. Please, yes. Hi, it's not a real question, but something to think about. And uh, uh, after a few things that you mentioned over there, well, if we go back, so I believe that the British tried to conquer Afghanistan, right, Linda? And then the Soviet tried to conquer it, and then the American. Everybody went out with his tail between his feet, and even us tried to <coughs> conquer Lebanon with the Christian, and we all know what, what happened over there. So how on earth we can think that few minor citizens in Saudi and all the other places, which are a minority within their countries because most of the work label, uh, uh, work are for foreigners. Why we should think that we can align with them against the people of those countries? And the same mirror question is to Gaza. I mean, at the end of the day, we know that what really matters is the population and the will of the people. That's my question or issue. I, I think that the whole world understands now that military force is only effective when you use it to hit and go out. If you try to take over a territory, you're starting to pay prices and very dear prices from the first day that you are standing on that territory. And you will continue to pay that price. And that's a lesson that many armies are learning. And you see the changes within military affairs around the world. Armies understand that taking over territory, what used to be the sign of clear victory in history, is no longer there. You are just losing if you're trying to take over a country. You can hit, come out. If you stay there, you will bleed and you will pay dearly. And uh, this is uh, uh, due to the shortage of time. Uh, this is, I mean, we have to just end up here. But I have to say something which is very, very important. And this is, again, a follow-up of these questions and what Alon said. Basically, what we see here is uh, something which is unheard of. Um, I mean, I mean, the question is right in place, but you know, when Israel is trying to foster its future strategy, it goes beyond military capacity, as you said. Uh, we have to take into account the social media devices, so to speak. We have uh, labs in Tel Aviv University where we do talk in Turkish, Farsi, Kurdish, Arabic to everyone in the Middle East. This is a different world. 
And we have to believe that there are other routes to be taken and to be used in order to broaden up the capacity of Israel to be integrated into the Middle East. The good news is that in contrast to the 20th century, Israel is not the ultimate enemy. Israel is part and parcel of the Middle East. And if we will know how to play the game, we will be part of these new alignments. And this is going actually to definitely uh, soften up some uh, main threats. And on the other hand, to uh, minimize uh, uh, the, uh, I would say, the margins of the danger. I, I would like to thank you, Alon. I mean, we could have sat <laughs> here for years, I can tell you. <laughs> and uh, uh, it is very, very, uh, um, I'm very pleased, actually, to have the, this. And uh, let me thank uh, the people here and uh, all around the globe uh, that were here, actually, with us today. I hope that you enjoyed this discussion. What I can assure you is that more is in the offing, and we are dealing with that day and night. Thank you for being here with us today. All the best. Shana Tova. And, uh, uh, thank you, Uzi. Thank you. And thank you, all of the supporters of uh, this fine establishment in the state of Israel. I hope to bring you good news.